Good morning, Central family. Welcome to worship here. Good morning to those who've found us online. Welcome. Um, I just have a couple announcements here. Uh, Back to Church Sunday, it's a national Canadian thing, is Sunday, September 15th. Uh, So come to church and then there'll be a potluck afterwards. Um, The next one worship night is September 29th at the Car 4 School, 5 Acadian Drive. And we've, um, Sarah and I have made these calendars, you know, uh, this month at Central, and we're going to do it every month, and you can take them home or put them on your refrigerator or your bulletin board at home, and it just lists everything going on that month. It's online as well. Um, So, uh, and they're at each entrance with the printed bulletin, just to keep us all informed of what's going on. Now that, can you believe that fall is already almost here and school starts next week oh my gosh the summer's almost over calm down trip it's okay we'll get through it together thank god we have each other um and then the only other thing is there's a ladies bible study on thursday and we just want to get a head count so if you could let jody know just so they can plan um and know how many would show up uh for that Uh, Other than that, check the calendar. It's online as well. Um, What a blessing to be here this morning. Why don't I just open us in prayer? Father God, we just thank you that we can freely come to you before you as we are with our scars and scrapes and our burdens and bruises. That's all you want. Come as you are. We love you and we just pray, Father, that that what we do here this morning, everything would just be lifted in praise and glory to you and that you would be pleased. So would you meet us here this morning, Father? We ask for a touch from you. Some of us need answered prayer. Some of us need healing. Some of us just need that assurance that you are near that, that faithful promise all throughout Scripture that as we draw near to you, Father, the promise is you will draw near to us because you're just already there. So be with us this morning. Touch us, teach us, mold us to be the people you want us to be. We love you, and what a blessing it is to be loved by you, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, and the church said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together. I'm going to read Psalm 96 first before we sing. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and glory are in his sanctuary. We're going to sing How Great Thou Art to start our service this morning.
familiar to some of you, but it's a really easy melody to catch on to.
mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands forever. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to pray wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to if you like. Um, I'm reading from 1 Peter 1, verse 7 to 9. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We're going to sing Refiner's Fire this morning as we come into our time of um, scripture and prayer and, and the sermon and reflection.
Our scripture this morning is from Hebrews 8, 1 to 13. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown up on, shown up on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator, is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I told them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So grateful that you have established the new covenant through Christ and that through your amazing love for us, you allowed your son Jesus to die on a cross so that we would have all have forgiveness of our sins and we truly can come to you as we are, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for the amazing gift of salvation that you have offered to us through Christ. And we just pray, Lord, that in this service now and in our lives today and every day, Lord, we would, because of your great love for us, Lord, knowing that no one in, in this earth will ever love us as you do, we just pray that we would return that love to you, Lord, and live our lives as a sacrifice to you, Lord, so that you can do great things through us because of your Holy Spirit that you have given to us to live in our hearts and to lead us and direct us in our lives every day. Lord, we thank you for being here today to, to worship you in music and um, prayer and scripture and praying now, Lord, for Tripp as he brings this morning message, Lord, that you would give him a special anointing of your spirit, Lord, to speak the words that you want us to hear, Lord. And we just pray that our ears will be open and that we will receive your instruction and your teaching, Lord, and that we will abide and that we will surrender to your living and guiding and directing our lives. Lord, we just pray for this day that all, Lord, as we continue to worship you, Lord, that our hearts and minds would be focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Isn't that a great chorus? If you've brought a Bible with you, we're in Hebrews chapter 8. 
So the first readers of this epistle to the Hebrews were tempted to abandon Jesus, to return to their Jewish faith because of very real persecution. Judaism had been the practice of their fathers and great-grandfathers and great-great-great-grandfathers and so on for centuries. Judaism was in their blood. For God had revealed Himself through the Hebrew Scriptures and the religious rites and the duties and the practices spelled out there were comfortable, were familiar and satisfying. So why would they endure persecution for a faith in this Jesus Christ? Why not just go back to the old ways that had been followed for centuries? Well, the author of Hebrews is, is attempting to counter this danger of drifting away. Something that all of us are tempted to do because we're human. The author explains the supremacy of Jesus Christ over the old ways. And he's shown us that Jesus is the one of whom the entire Old Testament was written. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that Scripture that's been prophesied and it all points to Jesus as God's high priest according to the order of Melchizedek Jesus is far superior to the Levitical priests and we talked about that last week so now as we come to chapter 8 the the author continues his argument that Jesus is a better the better mediator of the new covenant a better covenant founded on better promises This new and better covenant, unlike the old one, which was written on stone, is written upon flesh, each of our hearts thus transforming us from the inside out. As always, we will hopefully see that this better covenant, what it means for us now, today, how we can live in light of the reality of these better promises. There will be some challenges because God is always calling us to live better and do better and love better, but we have Jesus with us who's paved the way for us. So the first point is the supremacy of Christ's ministry. Here's verse 1. The point of all this now appears. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the heavenly majesty. Do any of you remember that reality show, Undercover Boss? I used to love watching the CEOs of these big companies disguising themselves as average Joes working and getting dirty in the maintenance of the business, production, assembly lines, whatever the business did, these bosses would actually do the dirty work. And, and uh, right alongside the everyday people who were hired to do it. The beauty of the show was seeing these successful, wealthy people not only learn the ins and outs of, of their business, but listening to the employees, the good, the bad. And there was a lot of ugly. And the show ended when these executives would take off the jumpsuits, uh, the glasses, the fake mustaches would come off. And then they would reveal that they were going to actually make things better from the ground up for everyone. It was a great show. It's it's kind of like, but obviously any human comparison to Christ is going to fall short. But the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ, our high priest, our CEO of our lives, is he doesn't just passive, you know, passively watch from heaven. He actually came down to us and and lived and dwelled among us. And nothing shocked Him. Nothing surprised Him either. Unlike the CEOs in that show, Jesus knew exactly what He was getting into. And now He knows what we're going through. Even before He came down from heaven. Hallelujah. Look at this phrase in verse 1. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of the heavenly majesty. You know, this phrase, it angers a lot of people. I'm not going to give my life to a God who just casually and passively sits in His throne up in heaven and just lets everything go crazy down here. But we have to remember the world in which this 
phrase this letter was written. In the ancient world, kings and queens, rulers and, and emperors had agents who acted and spoke and delivered messages, executed orders and laws on behalf of the ruler. Jesus, Son of God, is, is also called the agent of God. And these human agents would never sit because they were always actively representing the ruler here and there. When they were in the king's courts, they would stand to the right of the king. The king was seated. It's good to be the king, yes? But these agents were always standing. Why? Because the king's work was never done. There were always orders to carry out. There were always new treaties to be delivered and conveyed to other rulers and people to represent. They were never seated because their work was never complete. But friends, we can take comfort that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God having fully completed and carried out His work for our redemption. Amen? As He proclaimed from the cross, it is finished. Jesus is the only one who can say that He has faithfully completed the King's work. Here's our next point. Heaven is closer than you think. Jesus' ministry isn't distant. Hallelujah. It's intimate and, and personal. And even while He is seated at the Father's right hand, Jesus is actually continuing to work on our behalf. He's continuing to advocate and mediate for each of us. Jesus has every right to sit back and lean back, but He isn't, praise God. He's continuing to work for you, for you, for you, for you, for all of us. Amen. Look at verse 5. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the temple, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. All throughout Scripture, we're told that the life God is calling His people to should be a reflection or a shadow of things in heaven. This is tough to get our human minds around, isn't it? The ancient Jewish people really didn't spend much time at all thinking about life beyond this life, let alone heaven. The Greeks and Romans thought quite a bit about it, often confusing and confounding things to a point of absurdity, a God for everything and everything in between. Greek philosophy tried to sort it out, but it resulted in a very dualist belief. Plato and other philosophers proposed that heaven or the ideal reality was all spiritual and that our physical world, all matter, was a corrupted form or imprint from that. And that belief, that separation of spiritual and physical, that continues even today. The trouble is, all throughout Scripture, we're told that heaven is all around us. Much closer and far more even overlapping than we seem to think. And then, if heaven is purely spirit, what do we do with verses like this in Hebrews and other places in Scripture where we're told Jesus ascended to heaven as a human man, fully man, and now sits at God's right hand as fully God and fully man. Plato and, and Greek philosophy can't allow for this. And I love what N.T. Wright says. He says, heaven is not in the Bible simply a spiritual in the sense of non-physical dimension. It's God's space, God's realm, which interlocks with our realm our world, earth, in all sorts of ways. And just to make things one step more complicated, the Israelites believed that the temple in Jerusalem was the place above all where heaven and earth actually met. Quite literally, when you walked into the temple, especially when you went into the Holy of Holies in the middle of it, you were actually walking into heaven itself. So when the Hebrews talk about the temple or the wilderness tabernacle as a copy or shadow of the heavenly realities, the Hebrew writer is careful to explain what he means. The original tabernacle which accompanied the Israelites in the wilderness, 
continued as the center of Israelite worship until the temple was built by Solomon was constructed according to Exodus 25 to 31 on the basis of detailed instructions given by God himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. And also in other places in Scripture, in Numbers, Exodus 25, Exodus 40, we find similar instructions. God actually showed Moses the heavenly sanctuary when he was on Mount Sinai. He let him look through that flimsy curtain that separates God's space from our space. Could you imagine peeking in so that Moses could see the true reality and be sure that the earthly copy was somehow patterned after that majestic glory. Heaven is closer than we think, friends. Isn't that encouraging? That should comfort us. So are, are, are we living, and I've dealt with this in early on and in, in, in my faith journey, are we living as though Christ is distant, you know? Or do we recognize Him as ever-present our high priest, personal high priest who understands our struggles, who's continuing to advocate on our behalf. Maybe something we could do this week was, is consciously bring our challenges to him, and as we release those challenges to him, trust that he's taking them, and they're not just, you know, like email sent into the ether. Hopefully someone will receive it. No, physically picture Jesus taking your concerns, taking your suffering, your prayers, and then taking them to the throne room and advocating to the Father face to face on your behalf. That should transform the way we pray, shouldn't it? I mean, I just got chills thinking about that. And then the Holy Spirit is also advocating for us and sealing and, and, and guaranteeing that those sacred prayers that we've prayed are mediated and that God receives them beautifully, personally, intimately. What a beautiful image of the Trinity listening and loving and, and acting on our behalf. It's beautiful. Here's point three, the new covenant's transformation. Here's verse 10. This is the covenant I will establish after those days with the house of Israel. This is God speaking. My laws I will place in their minds, says the Lord, and write on their hearts. Thus I shall be God for all of them. They'll be my people indeed. You know, think of an artist, a, a painter or a sculptor or a musician who instead of sketching or painting on a canvas or composing a symphony on note paper creates his or her masterpiece directly upon your heart, directly in your heart. Unlike the old covenant, which was carved into tablets of stone, God's new covenant in Jesus Christ is inscribed in our hearts, transforming our desires and, and, and our actions from within. How often do we find ourselves striving and working to obey God you know, out of duty and, and obligation. Work, right? That's the work that, that, that Paul is, is saying, this isn't a part of our faith. That kind of work, that kind of striving to earn favor with God has no business in our faith because the work has already been done. The cross is empty, friends. Amen, right? The work is done, and this new covenant in Jesus now that that work is done and complete, all that's left for us to do is to delve deeper in relationship with the Almighty, the King Himself. You know, not just external commands, but, but an internal, if it's inscribed in our hearts, that should shape our emotions and our actions and our behaviors, right? Because it's more personal now. We're not just pleasing God. It's like children with parents. We do it out of love, out of wanting to please our king. And when he's pleased, he blesses us, and then we share the blessing. It's, it's this intimate, beautiful love cycle, right? No obligation. 
So this week, let's just pray for God to renew our hearts and, and renew our minds, making His desires our desires. And praise God, we have the assurance of forgiveness. Praise God. Listen to Hebrews 8:12. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is one of the most comforting verses in Scripture for me, and I pray it is for you too. You know, imagine carrying a, a heavy backpack. Micheline is always yelling at me about, well, not yelling, but... Because <laughs> I have so much in my backpack. I have my iPad, and I have our computer that I take here to use with the keyboard and cords and books, and, and it's so stinking heavy. <laughs> it's so stinking heavy. So imagine a heavy backpack, right, just filled with rocks filled with rocks. You don't have to think long to already feel the weight, do you? Now imagine that each rock is, is your sin, a sin of yours. And we all have lots of sins, don't we? So imagine that backpack full of those rocky sins on your back and, and failures and regrets and, and the shame that the devil wants to weigh you down in. And boy, is he working hard to weigh us down, isn't he? How heavy would your backpack be? How long have you been carrying it on your own? You know, the weight's unbearable, isn't it? Even just a couple. So in Christ, not only has God, if we allow Him, removed the backpack from us, immediately taking off that weight, right? Then He puts the bag down and, and, and takes out the rocks, casts it away. But then, and there's, <laughs> there's even more, as he casts them away, he doesn't just forgive, he forgets. Now, this statement confuses a lot of people, that God can actually forget our sins. It troubles a lot of people, Christian and non-Christian. If God can forget, how can he be all-powerful? But we have to go back to the original language to truly see what's going on. A more accurate translation is how the NIV translates it here. Remember no more. Remember not. Really, to choose to forget. You see the difference? It's God's choice. Of course He remembers everything. Of course He remembers everything He's created and and. He's the creator of all things. But he's choosing to not recall, to not bring back to the forefront of his mind, to not recollect upon our sins because of his son Jesus. He chooses to forget. Hallelujah. You know, the imagery here is like ink written on a piece of paper. I mean, we have erasable ink nowadays, but I mean, does it really work? Can you really erase ink? Can you see? There's still a little bit, there's still some traces of the ink above that second word test. But here is the imagery in Scripture is not only is the ink removed, it's as if it had never been there in the first place. That's powerful, isn't it? This is what God is choosing to do. And this should be tremendously encouraging for each of us. Amen? So here's the challenge this week. To many of us, and I'm putting myself right in because I do this too, how many of us continue to carry the weight of those sins that have been cast away? You know, why do we go back to that heavy bag that God removed from us? And maybe some of you are like me, that sometimes we find ourselves wading out into that vast ocean, waters, right? To, to, to find those rocks that He cast and forgot, but we haven't. He cast them away. Here's the truth, my family. Here's the reality. God has already forgiven us. The forgiveness He's offering you He's already forgiven you. He's already granted you and given you forgiveness 
in what he's offering you. What does that mean for us? We just receive it. Is, is, is the forgiveness of ourselves then stopping us from receiving what he's already done? What he's already done? If it wasn't done, Jesus would still be on the cross, right? He wouldn't be seated at the right hand of the Father because the work isn't complete. But the cross is empty. He's seated at the right hand of the Father because it's done. You are forgiven. Just receive it. Just receive it. He's already given it to us in Jesus, the better covenant. And Jesus assures us, promises us, that our sins are already forgiven and forgotten. It is finished. It's finished. Hallelujah. Praise God. This week, let's release those burdens to Christ. Can we do that? Embrace the freedom then? What do we do with the, the weights now gone? And you know, sometimes you can still feel that sort of empty energy of, of the weight having been lifted. Replace that with freedom. Replace that energy, that weight with open arms of, of gratitude that we're already forgiven and restored in Jesus. God's complete and utter forgiveness. Receive it. The better covenant that we live under today is anchored in Christ's supreme ministry. Amen? The, this better covenant in Jesus transforms us from the inside out. It assures us of complete forgiveness. In Jesus we know, and we can even taste, right, that heaven is so much closer than we think it is. Let's live in the fullness of this covenant then. Allowing Christ to shape our hearts and renew our minds and free us from the weight of sin. As we go forth this week, may we walk confidently in the reality that we are a part of this better covenant which, with, with better promises, friends, through our better high priest, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, our personal Savior. God bless all of you. I'm going to call the team back up and we're going to prepare by singing a song. We're going to prepare for communion. Would you stand as we sing, I exalt thee.
We've talked a lot about covenants in Core 52 and again in Hebrews. And our text today spoke of a new covenant made by God with his people. The old covenant, which required constant sacrifice, was no longer sufficient. A new one was necessary. The cost was high. An atonement sacrifice was necessary. But where would the sacrificial lamb come from? Jesus, the Son of God, said, I will be that sacrifice once for all time. The covenant is simple. If you trust in Jesus and accept him as your Lord and Savior, your sins will be forgiven. Verse 12 of today's scripture says so. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Each week at this table, we are called to remember this covenant. We remember that at the Passover meal so long ago, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He blessed it and he gave it to them, to his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body given up for you. And then he took the cup. He blessed it and he gave it to them saying, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. All of you, drink of it. The gift of salvation is free. The price has already been paid and it's ours for the taking. The covenant is made. God the Father has committed to it. Jesus, his son, died for it. Are you ready to do your part? Believe. this time in our service we give back to God out of the abundance that he has so graciously given to us you can do this in person there are boxes at the door uh, you can do it online or email or automated however whatever way works best for you but let's go to God in prayer and thank him for all that he's given to us Heavenly Father you've blessed us so much so much more than we deserve, but you, you've offered the forgiveness of our sins. You sent your son to die for us, so we just want to give back to you just a small portion of what you've so richly given to us. And we just pray that you would use these gifts to further the kingdom of your son here on earth. May your word go forth, and you promise that it won't return to you void, so we just pray that you would bless your word in this world today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to close with uh, the chorus of How Great Thou Art. If you would stand with us just to, we'll sing it through a couple of times.
Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Receive the promise. The promise has been made. Receive it. Walk in the promise. God bless you. Thank you. 